Um, Transfiguration Sunday. I'm going to start with the uh, colic of the day. So go to the, I think it's probably the back of the, um, of the uh, bulletin there, if you want to call it that. Um, thank you very much. Um, O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully have foreshowed uh, our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in his glory and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance uh, in heaven. Through Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Uh, Amen. So already here in the uh, colic, we're getting we're getting a little uh, sneak peek as to who we might be running into in the readings. Obviously Jesus and Moses and Elijah, uh, and and we know that in the Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah do show up and um, start to talk with Jesus. But then this wonderful voice that came from heaven, um, and you probably all know the words. Uh, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. That's we're going to hear that, um, and. Uh, uh, that uh, as we make the transition from Epiphany uh, to Lent, uh, I th- tra- Transfiguration, us celebrating Transfiguration uh, at the end of Epiphany is a very Lutheran thing. You go to other church bodies, a lot of uh, liturgical churches, they won't necessarily celebrate thank Transfiguration here. They'll wait and do it after Ascension. But we do it here, and I think, uh, I think this is genius on the Lutheran's part, because it does paint for us, okay, now Jesus is going to start his suffering, his passion, going to be suffering and dying, but but what is the point here? And we get a little glimpse of heaven, a little glimpse of God, Jesus in his glory, um, to help us get through uh, the season of, of Lent until we get to Easter. So that's, I think that's a wonderful kind of thing that the we as the Lutherans do, so very thankful for that. And with that, why don't, just, we're going to Read through the gospel lesson first from Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Um, now, I always enjoy when, um, you know, the first sentence, uh, after six days, Jesus, after what six, what happened six days earlier? I mean, that's, I always ask that question. What was six days earlier than that? Well, at the beginning of chapter 8, I'm going to give you a rundown what happened in chapter 8. Beginning of chapter 8 is the feeding of the 4,000. So we had the feeding of the 5,000 a little earlier. Now we have the feeding of the 4,000. So Jesus is feeding all these men, plus the women and children. Um, and then while that just finishes up, we have Pharisees showing up and asking Jesus for a sign to prove that he is the Messiah, which is kind of strange because if I'm Jesus, I would say, I just fed you know 4,000 men plus women and children. I think that's a pretty impressive sign. Well, they, they didn't want that sign. They want, you know, whatever. I don't even know what kind of sign they want, but Jesus is performing these miracles, these signs, um, um, but that's not what they want. And then Jesus warns everybody about the Pharisees and them asking signs. And really they are pointing to themselves and saying, look how, what I'm doing in order to be saved. So Jesus warns uh, them about that. And then we have, in the midst of all this, Jesus performs a sign. He heals a blind man. So they ask for a sign, but Jesus does a little later. And then, kind of I think the high point of chapter 8 is Jesus asks the question, who do people say that I am? And Peter comes and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the one. And then if you remember, right after that, Jesus calls Peter who? Well, that, but a couple, you know, Jesus then makes his passion prediction. We're going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. And Peter pulls him inside and says, oh, no. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So I find that Peter's on this mountaintop, which we'll get to chapter 9. Um, oh, yes, you are the Christ. Yes, you are right, Peter. Da, 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 da. You know what that means? I'm going to go suffer and die and rise again so that people can have forgiveness. And Peter says, oh, no. That should never be. Oh, get behind me, Satan, because you have not in mind the things of men, but uh, you have not in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So, so we have this this rather I would like to say uh, rather roller coaster 
what's happening in chapter 8. And at the end of it, in this conversation, Jesus tells his disciples, and you and me, uh, in order for us to follow him, we have to take up our cross and follow him. So what Jesus is saying, there will be, uh, in order to follow me, you will have a life of suffering because of you're my disciple, because you are a Christian. Not because you get old and arthritis. I mean, that, that's not the reason, but it's because you're going to be persecuted because you're a follower of Jesus. And in the Lutheran Study Bible, if you're following along on that, there's like three pages of notes that's between chapters 8 and chapter 9. I don't even know what the notes were. I skipped over them. Now let's get to chapter 9. Verse 2. After six days. So that was, so we, this is a week between chapter 8 and chapter 9. Uh, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. So they're, they're going up on a mountain. Now we're, we're not quite sure exactly where this is, uh, but we think it's northern part of Israel. Up here on the map. So somewhere up here. Um, and he's transfigured before them. And his clothes become radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. So there, he, he's in his glory, his heavenly glory. And he's there, brightness. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now, this story shows up in Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, and Luke's gospel. It's in Luke's gospel where we get details as to what the conversation was about. We, it's just here, they were talking. In Luke's gospel, it talks about uh, Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus about his exodus that was to happen, meaning how he would go to Jerusalem, fulfill that passion prediction. He's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to suffer, he's going to die, he's going to rise again, and then there'll be the ascension. So that's, that. we, we have this wonderful little conversation as that's going on. And Peter, James, and John are listening to the conversation. I mean, that's, that's what they're doing. But I think Peter wants to be part of the conversation because they knew it was Moses and Elijah, which would beg the question, how would the apostles or the disciples know it was Moses and Elijah? How would they know that? Now, my younger brother-in-law when he was much much younger um, shared with the family how they knew it was Moses and Elijah because they were wearing their AAL name tags <laughs> hi I'm Moses and I think that's how we'll be in heaven that we'll have our not thriving AAL name tags um, <laughs> that we'll just know that no which would beg the question, <laughs> and this is a little side note here, will we recognize people in heaven? Will we recognize Moses and Elijah in heaven? I think, the, I think here the answer is yes. I think we will recognize people. I think we will, people that we don't even know. I think we'll just, or eventually we'll get to know them. I mean, that we're going to be there eternity for eternity, so that's what it is. So Moses, now could it be that, Jesus in his this talking with them and say, hey Moses, what do you think? Or hey Elijah. And they say, oh, listening. So whatever it is. Now, why Moses and Elijah? Of all the people in the Old Testament, why Moses and Elijah? What does Moses represent? The law. The law, the Ten Commandments. He is, he is the law. And then Elijah, what does he represent? Now, when we say the Old Testament, we always say, in the Old Testament, there is the law and the, what's that other word? Prophets. The law and the prophets. I mean, that's kind of the, the gist of the Old Testament, kind of shorthand, that's what that is. Elijah represents all the prophets. Now, what's interesting with Moses, uh, he wrote, I mean, we have the first five books of the Old Testament written by Moses, majority of it. We don't have books written by Elijah. He is the speaking prophet. There are no books. There's no book of Elijah. We have it in uh, 
First Kings and Second Kings about Elijah, and pe- people, other people write about Elijah. So, so you you have that. Now, one of the other things, um, when um, uh, going on earlier in the church year, which had to do with um, them coming to um, uh, John the Baptist and wondering if he is the one. Are you the Messiah? And they asked the question, are you, um, are you the one? No. Are you the prophet? Well, the prophet was, Moses said there would come a, a man who would come like Moses, the prophet. And the other one is, are you Elijah? Because it was prophesied that before Messiah would come, there would come someone in who would uh, uh, come in the spirit of Elijah. Well, that was John the Baptist, that we know that. In fact, the way Elijah dressed and the way John the Baptist dressed was very much alike. They were wearing camel skins and eating strange food and, I mean, things like that. So they said, oh, are you it? And John says, no, I'm not the one. But Jesus comes back and says, well, actually, he, he was. He was the one. He was the forerunner. He was the one preparing the way of the Lord. So you have kind of the whole Old Testament represented there in Moses and Elijah. And then you have Jesus which I would say he represents the gospel, the good news of God's salvation. I think this is, we are saved by God's grace. You know, you can look at Moses and the law and say, ah, we have the law. If we just could keep the law perfectly, then we would be saved. I mean, that was kind of the thought there. And then you had Elijah, you know, he's the speaking prophet, so he's speaking the law, he's speaking God's word that that people would follow. But then you have Jesus. Now, as Moses and Elijah and Jesus are speaking, Peter, I just picture Peter doing this. And then he gets in. Rabbi, verse 3, or verse 5, it's good that we are here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And I like this, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified meaning they, the apostles, the disciples. So Peter's just running his mouth. Classic Peter. Rabbi, this, this is great. And we should build, and the word is tabernacle. It's not just tent, it's tabernacle. Tabernacle in the Old Testament meant that God was present. He didn't want to leave. Now, to be honest with you, if I was up on the mountain with Jesus and saw Moses and Elijah, I wouldn't want to leave either. I think That was pretty cool. I would love to stay there. Just listen to them talk and all that. But he's he's going, but but, 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 you know what? Um, uh, We should build three tents. One one for each of you. We do that. Let's make that happen. Um, And then verse 7. And a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. So you have Moses and Elijah but the person you really need to be listening to is Jesus. You need to listen to Jesus. He, he, his words are most important. You got the law with Moses. You got Elijah preaching the law. But it's really the words of Jesus that, I would, they say, trumps them all, that we are saved by God's grace. And then suddenly... Looking around, they no longer saw anyone uh, with them but Jesus only. So, boom, boom. so that's that wonderful picture. And then you have verse 9 here. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So the question is, why would Jesus tell them not to say anything? Because they wouldn't, no one would believe them. Yeah, they would think they were what? Crazy. Yeah. Oh, you won't believe this. Jesus. He was speaking to Moses and Elijah. Uh, how, how early did you start your drinking there, Peter? I mean, that, that was, you know, don't say anything until, until. That means they couldn't even tell the other disciples, which I think that, I, I just can't imagine them going, we can't tell any, we can't take nothing to nobody, any, can't even tell our wives? Nope. Can't, tell, can't say anything, nothing, until after. And then they would, and then we do. Then we know that because it's written down. I mean, we have them in the Gospels. So uh, 
that's what's going on. So that's what we're, we're seeing here. And, and the main thing is listen to Jesus. Listen to what Jesus has to say. All right. Now, this is not the first time that Moses and Elijah um, were either on a mountain or caught up in the glory of God. Now, on Transfiguration Sunday, it's a twofer Old Testament deal. We have two Old Testament readings for this Sunday. Ooh, and it doesn't cost you any extra. It's just that we're going to throw one in just because. And the first one is from 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. Let's run over there. Now, Elijah. What do you know about Elijah? What are some things that come to mind about Elijah? He dressed funny. He dressed funny. He ate funny. He ate funny. Okay, I, I gave you those answers. But what else about Elijah? Did he die? He didn't die. In fact, we're going to read about this as we come to the end of Elijah's life, which is very interesting, that he doesn't die physically. What else do you, what else do you remember about Elijah? Right, he did, and that came right after he did his battle with the prophets of Baal, which was in, um, uh, what's not on this map, but, but, but on um, Mount, Mount Carmel, if you remember that story, yeah. up here, um, uh, where um, Elijah finally said, okay, you get all your prophets of Baal and the Asherah, and I'll come, and we'll build a couple altars, and we'll see who the true God is. And so that was the deal. He let them go first. They put the sacrifice. They get all the wood. And he says, but the only thing you can't do is you can't start it. And it's the, the God, your gods have to start it. And so all day they're running around and crying out and cutting themselves. And all the time Elijah's sitting over there just egging them out. Oh, they must be sleeping. Oh, or they must have went out for lunch. Oh, maybe they're going to the bathroom. Just kind of, and they said, oh, okay. And so Elijah says, all right, uh, here it is, uh, pour water on it. Pour, pour it like three times, pour a lot of water on it. So it's drenched. So there, there's no way that they could say, well, that was sitting on all day, a little electric, tech, you, know, uh, you know, static kind of started to go. So it was soaked, I soaked. And he prays, <clears throat> fire comes down, consumes the sacrifice, the wood, and the stones, not only what Elijah built, but what Baal built. And everyone, oh, Elijah's God is the true God. And so Elijah then destroys 700 prophets of Baal. I don't even know how he did that, but he did it. And then Queen Jezebel didn't like that. So she's running after him. And he runs for his life. And he goes down to Mount Hermon, which would be down here. We also call it Mount, not Horeb, Mount Horeb, sorry, Mount Sinai. And so he's there, and that's where he's, he's going, I'm done to take my life. And God says, no, here, eat something. And then listen, oh, is he in the earthquake? No. Is he in the fire? No. Is he in the wind? No. But he's in the small. So Elijah, very significant prophet of the Old Testament. Now here we're coming towards the end of Elijah's earthly journey. And he has uh, his buddy with him called Elisha, who will then become the next great prophet. And so that's where uh, we are with this. So chapter 2 of 2 Kings. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far out as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. For they went down to Bethel. And then the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Or shut up. I don't want to hear it. I mean, I, don't, I just don't want to hear it. That's, that's what it is. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Answer, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. 
Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them. And as they both were standing by the Jordan, then Elijah took the cloak and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let me... Uh, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit upon me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am about as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they were still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father the chariots of Israel, and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. So Elijah is carried up into heaven in the whirlwind chariots of fire thing. Now, just on the map here, come to find out there are many places called Gilgal in the Holy Land. There's not just one. I, they, I'm going, it's like, well, anywhere. You know, there's more than one New Haven in the United States. I mean, I, I didn't know if you knew that. Whenever I sign off, you know, Scott from New Haven, oh, are you in Connecticut now? No, I'm still in Indiana. <laughs> so what we believe what's going on is that Elijah knows he's about to leave. So he goes from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho and to the Jordan. So we think he's going on a farewell tour, saying goodbye to all his friends. So he's going to these different places, and he's asking Elisha to stay. But Elisha says, oh, no, I'm coming with you. And along the way, these sons of the prophets... Now, if you remember, um, when Elijah was in the cave, Elijah kept saying, I'm all by myself. Uh, There's there's no others. There's nobody else here. And God says, I want you to know that there are 700 other people, prophets, that I have saved. So we think that these are part of the, the 700 that God protected while Ahab and Jezebel were trying to inflict much pain on the prophets, the people of God uh, during Israel. So we think that that these are those people. So they were trained, they were preachers, if you want to call them pastors, but preachers um, and things like that. So that's what goes on. So they get to the Jordan. So they're on the west side of the Jordan. They get to the the Jordan and and Elijah rolls up his cloak, kind of like a staff, which would remind you of what other Moses and if you remember, Moses used his staff in the water. You had the, well, you had the parting of the Red Sea down here somewhere. And then when they went into the Promised Land, the waters parted again in the Jordan River, and they all walked through dry ground. So they walked to the other side, and Elijah was carried up into heaven. There are only two people. This would be a Jeopardy question, final Jeopardy. What, who are the only two people in the Bible that didn't die but ended up in heaven? Well, you know one, Elijah. The other is Jesus. Enoch, who walked with God. Jesus died. Remember, Good Friday, he died. Um, so you got Enoch, the only two. Just Enoch, he walked with God, and he just continued to walk with God. Didn't come back. Then you got Elijah. So Elijah's carried up into heaven. By the chariot, we're wooden, whatever, whatever that is. How did Elijah know when this would all happen? I think you get the impression that the Lord told him that that it. On Tuesday. Whatever, yeah. And he just kind of okay, we're going. And then you had the sons of the prophets saying, "You know what, Elisha? He's going." Elisha knew. I think Elisha knew as well that this was going to happen. So. Yeah, but the, the exact. Yeah, we don't know the exact time. I don't. I mean, we didn't say it. You know. November 27th, 750 B.C. I mean, we don't know that, but I think somewhere along the way, the Lord must have let Elijah, he, or give him that sense that this, now it's time to go. Well, the thing that amazes me about this story is that to go from one place to another to another, that was a lot of walking. 
It was a lot of walking. And they did it all in right. one day? Yes. Well, I think from Gilgal to Bethel is 12 miles. And then from, from Bethel to Jericho was another 7 miles. And then whatever how far Jericho is from the Jordan. I, I don't even know. There's no, this is not drawn to proportion yeah. on the map that we have on the wall here at, in the family life room. I'm just telling that to people who are listening. Um, that so yeah they, they did a I mean that's what they did they did a lot of walking. But, but even one leg of that journey would take all day. I would well, you would think so. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I can walk a mile in about twenty minutes. I think you know, so that's I mean I I walk a mile in about twenty minutes. I mean that's what that is. So, and it wasn't easy walking either. I mean it was. When, you know, when they would say they're going up, that meant they literally were climbing up to get to where they were going. I mean, so you, you had that. Now, the nice thing about this is that they were going down to the Jordan, so it was more of a decline than an incline. So, um, so, that's, so the, this is the first. He's taken up into heaven, the great prophet of Elijah. Um, and then Elisha, he does see Elijah carried up, so he's going to get the double portion. And if you read through the rest of Second Kings, you're going to see what Elisha does. He does get the double. He does. He performs twice as many miracles as Elijah. You know, he's he's going to affect. I like to say as many people as Elijah. So, but Elisha. Now, my favorite story of Elisha is that. He was a, he didn't have any hair. He was bald. And one day, he was walking around, and a whole bunch of these young boys were making fun of the baldy. And this bear came out of nowhere and mauled them all. And so what's the lesson of the story from that? Don't make fun of bald people, because bears show out of nowhere and kill you. So just keep that in mind. And if you want to make a fun of a bald person, beware of bears. Just throwing that out. It's, you laugh, but it's true. Okay. It's true. Do you not believe be, was his going to heaven before Elijah? Yeah, it's, that's in Genesis uh, 6, 5 or 6. And, and as it goes through the genealogy in Genesis... It just said, Enoch walked with God, and he just kept walking. He just walked, he just, which meant, and I, you could take that too, look. Yeah, he's walking physically with God, but I think it also means that he was in close relationship with God as well, meaning that he, he just walked up to heaven. God brought him home to heaven, so he didn't die physically. So there are two people in heaven that we know of that didn't die physically, but got there. That didn't mean they didn't die spiritually. We all die spiritually because of sin, but they didn't die physically. So, um, so that'll be one of those when you get to heaven. Oh, there's Enoch. Oh, there's Elisha. Oh, they're in that club. <laughs> the rest of us are in the other club. We all die. All right. Now the bonus reading from Exodus twenty uh, thirty four. We all know about Moses. Uh, here, uh, Moses is up on Mount Sinai. And being up on Mount Sinai, he's getting the Ten Commandments, and he's talking with God. Um, our epistle reading will help explain what this is, kind of what this all means. Uh, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, he came down from the mountain. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. So he was in the presence of God, the glory of God, and so his face just lit up. Uh, Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai, or in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak to him in the tabernacle, 
that you got to know that, that he's going to talk to God in the tabernacle, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. So you have this, this story. Moses would speak with the Lord. He, he would be, and his face would just shine, shine and shine and shine. Yes, and he would have to put a mask on. <laughs> That's funny. I'll have to remember that. Um, Got to put your facial mask on. But he would cover it because it was so bright, people were afraid. So um, he would go and speak to the Lord. He would come out. He would say what the Lord would say, what he wanted him to say, and then he would cover his face because people were just... They were, they were afraid of Moses because of this bright, shining face. Now, Cecil B. DeMille captured that in the Ten Commandments because at the, if you remember at the early in the movie, kind of Moses looks a little grimy, but at the end, everything is gray and white. So he goes up on the mountain, and he, they kind of did that. He never had to put the veil. They didn't show the veil over his face, but that's what that is. So you have the, the so he's covering the veil. Now remember, Moses represents what of the Old Testament? The law. The law. He re- represents the law, the, the, the commandments and everything that goes along with that uh, in the law. So when they're up on the Mount of Transfiguration, you have the law and the prophets and you have Jesus. You have, have the, uh, Jesus representing the gospel. So that's, I mean, this is just, there's not a lot of deep theological stuff going on here. If you turn to the epistle reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, this, this, is, this explains what just happened. Um, verse 12. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Now, once again, you've got to figure out, well, what is Paul, what, what do you mean we have such a hope? Well, in the beginning of chapter 3, he goes through and saying, oh, yeah, we have the law, but really we have this ministry of reconciliation. Or I like to say is that God has accepted us through Christ Jesus. We have received grace and mercy because of Jesus. So we have this wonderful hope, this wonderful, you know, great and glorious promise that God makes to us that we, we have this. Um, so when he says that we have such a uh, hope, it's talking about the glory of Christ, the, the promise, the gospel. Um, and because of that, he says, now we can be very bold because we have this wonderful gift. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. As we read in the Old Testament that... As the years went on, that, that shining, did, it kind of wore off. So that by the time we get to 40 years later in the entering of the promise, you don't even hear Moses doing this anymore. You don't even, it's not even mentioned. It's not. So that glory of the law has kind of worn off. Therefore, verse 1 of chapter 4, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves um, to anyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing, meaning those who don't believe. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as his servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what Paul is saying here is, you know what, you got Moses and you got the law, and the law's function is to really to remind us that we need a Savior, but that Savior is Jesus. And that's the glory. That's, 
That's the real glory that God wants us to see, is that the promise of the Messiah, the promise of the gospel, the promise that our sins are forgiven because of what Jesus has done for us. Now, are there some who live in our world that don't get that? Yes, they, it is. And, and Paul even says that they are, they are, I just say, they're the ones with the, with the veil on, they're the ones with the blinders on, that they don't see that. Um, but that, that, but Paul will go on, but that doesn't mean we don't keep sharing with them that, that they do, that they can see, that the veil is removed from their face as well. Um, but he's talking about those who don't get it, you know, they say we can be saved by the works of the law. Paul says, no, we can and it's, we're saved by Jesus. It's through Jesus and Jesus alone that we have that. Um, and so, um, we have that, that, that great hope that we have, you know, hope that it's, you know, it's going to happen. I mean, that, that we, that's what we hold on to. Uh, that's what we have. Okay? And he, that, I find that this explains the event of transfiguration. I mean, we say, oh, there it is. Well, what, what does this mean? Well, what this means is, and as, as, uh, uh, as the cloud from, from, uh, the voice from the cloud came, and that's the Father, his most important thing is, listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. What does Jesus have to say? And then we're going to get in the season of Lent, kind of church year wise, the first Sunday in Lent is the temptation of Jesus. Well, how did Jesus handle that? What did he do? He used the, he used the word of God. You know, it is written. Da, 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 da. So we, we have that. So as we go through the season of Lent, and we'll get to Good Friday, you know, the, the, the final words, the great words, it is finished, you know, all is done, we don't have to do any more, and then we'll get to Easter, to which then we get to say the wonderful phrase that we all look forward to, which I'm not going to say now, because I'm going to wait till we say it, in about seven weeks from now. Um, that's, that's what we have. Um, and so, that's what's going on. All right? Questions on that? And then we have the psalm of the day from Psalm 50. Uh, the mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Um, the, uh, uh, as, as they're looking at Jesus, he is white as white can be. I mean, he, it, it just had to have been an awesome sight. Uh, our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with, with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. So when it says, listen to Jesus, this kind of, he's calling out that we come follow him. And this, and, and this whole, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice, Really, the covenant here for us New Testament Christians would be the Lord's Supper, would be given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. So when we do that, that Jesus is still calling out to us, which is just, I think that, that gives me great comfort in knowing that Jesus is still there. He's still calling out. No matter what's happening in our lives, no matter, you know, whatever's going on, that Jesus is still there. He's still the mighty God. He's the one that we should listen to and that we do that um, uh, for our whole lives. Questions? Yes. Kind of off the subject, but do you know offhand how many times God spoke from the cloud? Uh, this is my beloved son. That, the, in, the new, in the gospel, this would be number two. The first one, and the season of Epiphany does this. They kind of have bookends here. We have Jesus' baptism, if you remember that, and, and the voice came, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. And then we have the, and that's why we as Lutherans put transfiguration at the end of Epiphany saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. So we have the, the two, the ends there, and especially during the season of Epiphany, and saying, oh, here's the beloved one. Oh, listen to him. So we do have that um, in Jesus. Now, God does, 
you know, speak from the cloud in other places as well. And he just kind of speaks out of the blue, too. I mean, just kind of, you know, the one story is, you know, Paul is trying, or Saul, Paul, trying to destroy the church, and he's on his way to Damascus, and lo and behold, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Falls off his horse. He's blinded because the, the brilliance is, I mean, physically blinded, and then he's healed. So we, we have that. And then you have um, uh, Mo, God, you, know, you mentioned that the story of Elijah, as God is speaking, and he's speaking that, that, that whisper, that, vo- that whatever that, and I don't even know what that is. I mean, I, I, don't even, I can't even imagine what that would be like. But God speaks in that still, small voice. I mean, you, we do, I mean, there are many other places okay. that that's happened, that God, does he do it today? Um, he speaks through his word all the time. I mean, that's where he says, you know, in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son, meaning the word of God from the book of Hebrews. So we have that. Yes. Another question. Um, I, I believe, haven't we been into 1 Corinthians? Yes. Most of, and we've been in Mark chapter 1. Yes, and we did a fast forward to Mark chapter 9. Okay, if we had gone through all the Sundays after Epiphany up to number 8 or so, would we have we would have gotten to chapter 2. <laughs> because last week was the end of chapter 1. Okay. Now, 2 Corinthians, we will pick up 2 Corinthians during the season of Pentecost next calendar year, but in this church year. Uh, I think somewhere around June or July, we'll get to 2 Corinthians in the church year. So... Um, so that's what's going to happen. Now, we'll move into the season of Lent, and we're going to be jumping all over the place in the life of Jesus. So we're not going to go chronological in that. And the Old Testament will, all, will line up with the gospel. And then the epistle lesson, they did a pretty good job with lining that up with the other two readings as well. So we're, we won't be reading through a book like we did for Epiphany. For that second reading, it'll be, it'll be jumping around. Now... We are in series B. You know what that means? <laughs> that Lent 4B, which is my third most favorite Sunday of the church year, is coming up. Which means we'll be reading from Numbers 21, Ephesians 2, and John 3. <laughs> Am I looking forward to that? Oh, yeah. Because it's John three sixteen, Ephesians two, by grace you are saved, and and the numbers thing is the the serpents coming into the camp, and the only way that they can be saved is they have to look at the serpent on the staff. And Jesus says in John three, that was really pointing to me on the cross. You just got to look to me. You got to have faith. Oh, we're saved by in in Ephesians two is oh we're saved by God's grace through faith. That whole that beautiful and how that puts that together. So. I have a couple more weeks before we get there. But we're going to get there. Lent 4P. So, but today, transfiguration. I have a question um, regarding length of time. Okay. Because, you know, a lot of things jump back and forth. Yes. For approximately how long did Jesus and the disciples how long were they together about three years jesus earthly ministry from the time from his baptism and and temptation when he starts earthly ministry until the resurrection ascension is about three years a little over three years <clears throat> and they so were together after the resurrection. they were together after but jesus was only here for 40 days yeah. until he ascended so it's about three that's why i say three three and a half years um, for that. And so early on, it's, it's Peter, James, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, early, early on. And then he amasses the, the rest of them. And then as, and really it's in the season of Pentecost, in the summer when we will go back to Mark 2 
and we'll start to go through chronologically in Jesus' life and how that is. So they're, to, they're going to be together. By the time we get to the Mount of Transfiguration, we think this is about nine months before Good Friday. So it's going to be the fall of the year. So nine months before, well, if you did March or April, whatever that is. It's not even that. That might be June, you know, July, somewhere in there. We think that's where that is. Because um, in, in Luke's gospel, Luke is very detailed about this. When the transfiguration, that all takes place. Um, in, in Luke chapter 9, 951, there's a turning point in Luke's gospel. Not so much in Mark's gospel. It's there, but Luke is very deliberate. He says in Luke 9, 51, and then Jesus turned his face toward Jerusalem. Meaning, Jesus was now a man on a mission. So for the next eight, nine months, he's going to make his way down to Jerusalem. And along the way, he's saying, this is the reason I'm going. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. And he does that three times. And every time he does it, he gives more details as to what's going to happen. So that by the third time, he's almost naming names. Oh, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes who will hand me over to Pontius Pilate, and this is what's going to happen to me. I'm going to be crucified. They're going to put me on the cross. And I'm going to rise again. I mean, it was always, and I'm going to rise again. When we get to Good Friday, you, you think the disciples forgot about the, and I'm going to rise again. Because they're not going, they're going, oh, I was lost. I mean, they're thinking this is all done. It's not till Jesus rises again when they go, oh, and it's not really until Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes that all of a sudden, it's all, I have to say, all the dots are connected. All, it all makes sense that this is what was going to happen. So, you know, uh, you know, when we start, you know, in, in Mark's gospel a little bit, he, they, he talked about, Luke is very, he says, and he turned his face towards Jerusalem. It was like, I'm not going to stop. It's like he had blinders on. He was not going to be de- detained from doing his job, his mission. And this comes right after the transfiguration and the question of, who am I? Oh, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. So, it, 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 Luke's gospel is very detailed in that part, um, much more than Mark. You know, And there's nothing wrong with that. I just that's That's just the way it is. But yeah, so... Get back about three years, three and a half years, give or take. Now, could of Peter, Andrew, James, and John know Jesus before that all happened? Probably. I mean, they all grew up in the same town. I mean, they were all in Capernaum. So it's quite possible that they might have known each other before. I mean, that, that oh, there's that Jesus. Yeah, we know him. Oh, that's Peter and Andrew. They, they're, they, they go out fishing. So that... that it's quite possible they would have known, some of them would have known each other beforehand. But it's not till the baptism of Jesus and then he begins his earthly ministry, then I want to make you fishers of men, Jesus says to them. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. Just a few observations from my trip. Harkening back to last Sunday, we were in the temple where Jesus was with his authority preaching. In the synagogue. Synagogue. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then, then he went to Peter's house, or, yeah, you know, Peter's yes. house where his mother-in-law was That That's just like across the street. Yes, that was not that far. It was just very, very It would have been in very much walking distance on a Sabbath day, walking distance, which we would say was anywhere between one and two miles that they yeah, could walk. Yeah. But this this was just very close. Very close. They would have. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> we were taken to the top of Mount Carmel. Yes. And I, the bus took us there. Mount Carmel, <laughs> yes. And then we got up and we walked up further. And we were told this is the place where... Uh, Elijah mm-hmm. called down the fire, and I mean, of course, today it's it's just a place, right? You know, right. But 
But then, then we were called over to a fence, a, a stone, stone wall, and we were said, <coughs> we were told, do you see over there, a couple miles over there, that mountain, you, you, you know it by such and such, and do you, do you all see it? That is supposedly the Mount of Transfiguration. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right. There, yeah. There's a couple places where they think the transfiguration took place. That's the one of them. Up on this map, they have it up on Mount Hermon, which would have been the farthest away in Jesus' adult life that he was from Jerusalem. And he's having this little, yeah. you know. So that there, there are, you know, many, yeah. Yeah. you know, I think there's two or three spots where the, the tomb of Jesus is in Jerusalem. I mean, that's, uh, they don't know for sure. They're guessing. They're pretty certain about the birthplace of Jesus. They seem to be pretty certain about that, but the, 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 res the tomb. The problem is this. Jesus died and rose 2,000 years ago, and the, the city gets built up. I mean, it's under feet, feet of, of dirt and stuff. So it, it's kind of hard to guess there. So, but yeah. To see that, so that's where where all that is. So good. Next week will be Ash Wednesday, so we'll be having a Bible class and then uh, be ending a little earlier than we normally do, especially during these next six weeks because of church. We'll be um, ending, but we'll still start at nine thirty, like we have been. So with that, all right. Let's close with the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.